The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke in the 13th chapter. Now, when Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day, just then a woman appeared with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. And she was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. And when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. And when he laid his hands on her immediately, she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue in, was indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath day, kept saying to all the crowd, now there are six days on which work ought to be done. You come on those days to be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath day untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? And when he said this, all his opponents were put to shame. And the entire crowd was rejoicing at the wonderful things that Jesus was doing. Now the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the living word of God will stand forever. Amen. Will you please be seated?
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Icebergs. We only see 10% of an iceberg when it's floating at sea. The Titanic learned this lesson, that 90% is hidden under the water and not seen. This is what one might call an iceberg scripture lesson. 90% is hidden. 10% is what we see. We see Jesus teaching on the Sabbath, as was his custom. We see a woman who, for whatever medical reasons we may call today, is bent over that all she can see now is the ground as she stumbles forward in her life. And those of you who have had back pain, it can become quite debilitating. Can you imagine if your back had now grown so that it was a 90 degree angle with your standing legs, the pain of it, the humiliation of it, the agony of it. And Jesus has finished his lesson. We see that. And he sees this woman bent over. And he calls her, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. And then he lays his hands on her, and then she stands up straight. And what does she do? She begins to praise God. Her life has been radically changed. We see a leader of the synagogue. We hear that he has become indignant. And he says to the crowd, crowd, you've got six days to get healed. Don't come here on the Sabbath day and expect to be healed. It is breaking the law of Moses. The law of the Sabbath. Now we think, what a petty man. This must be, this leader, this religious. How nitpicking, how hard-hearted, how cruel. Can't he see it? And Jesus once accused many of them at straining at gnats and swallowing camels, emphasizing the wrong thing. Now, I'm going to say something, but you've got to hang with me here. I'm going to tell you that Jesus was breaking the law. At least the law that had been handed down through generations of people. According to Mosaic law, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. But there is so much more to this text. We're only seeing 10%. There is 90% underneath. It's not only about this man's religious narrowness, but what Jesus is doing is refocusing the intent of the Jewish religion. You've got it all wrong. You're emphasizing the wrong things. And why? It's 
because you do not understand God in the proper perspective. And Jesus is always in a conflict with religious individuals. And the cause of that conflict, I put to you that Jesus sees God in a different way than the religious people see God. Now first, I, I implore you to stay hooked or, or listening because we need to clarify what the law is. What is it? In the context of Jesus is talking. What is the purpose? Now you must remember, it has been over a thousand years since Moses came down from Mount Sinai carrying those stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. Now, I realize that as soon as I say Moses, many of you are going to think of Charlton Heston. I don't blame you. It's never left my mind. It has, it has been implanted in me, that wild hair and those big commandments that he is taking. I like Charlton Heston. But what started out as Ten Commandments by Jesus' day has grown to 613 commandments, all based on the original Ten Commandments. What began in Judaism as a voice from God to Abraham? Abraham, pick up and go. And Abraham heard, and Abraham went. What began as the voice telling Moses, go up on this holy mountain and receive these commandments. And Moses did as he was commanded when he heard God. The same is true of Jeremiah that Phil read. I knew you before you were even born, and Jeremiah listened. Elijah, and on with the prophets, Isaiah. It was a voice from God, and their response to God. That was the sum and total of the essence of religion. But by the time of Jesus the law referred to to 613 different commandments. And it couldn't have been brought down by Moses because in that law, I had the privilege to read Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy this past week to search out every one of those. It couldn't have been in the day of Moses because it talks about how to dispose properly of real estate. The only real estate they had in the days of Moses was a mass desert that none of them owned. So what we see is the influence of the Levite, the priestly class, in kind of molding this to fit their desires. Most scholars do not believe that Moses wrote the 613. Ten. It talks about the priesthood in great deal. You can tell that's a development of the priesthood. The only priest they had in Moses' day was Aaron, one. Now, I would share with you just briefly a few gleanings of the 613. One of the laws is that a man can sell his daughters into slavery. Now I got three daughters and there's no way on God's green earth I'm going to sell them into slavery. 
I might marry them off, and they might think that's slavery. But there's no way. Also, one of the laws validates ethnic cleansing. When you conquer a land, destroy the people. We would be brought up on war crimes today. Now, those of you who have raised children, have you ever had them backtalk you? Act rebellious against you? No, we're Presbyterians. All our children do it decently and in order, don't they? But you know what the law says you should do with a child like that? Take them outside of the city and stone them to death. And finally, I just throw this in for fun. One of the laws, a woman shall not dress like a man. If you got pants on today, you're a disgrace if you're a woman. You're dressing like a man. What is considered to be law in the time of Jesus would for us be considered to be barbaric, repugnant, and out of line. Moses gave Ten Commandments, but the people had built this system that sought to legislate almost every single action in another human being's life. Rest assured, most likely if you were enjoying it, anything in the time of Jesus, it was probably against the law. You see, this woman is not the only thing that is bent over and she can't look to God in, in God's heavens. But the religious system has been bent over and cannot even see heaven. Jesus once said, you heap tremendous burdens on them and will not lift one finger to help. God had become, in a way, an enemy of the people. Fear was the greatest emotion in regard to God. Jesus confronted religious leaders over and over. Now, I will grant that, politically speaking, Jesus was a threat to their power. But underneath the surface of that threat was something deeper. Jesus was bringing an idea of God that they did not accept. They knew about kings. It was a hierarchical system. They had developed a hierarchy. And the more strict and stringent you were, the holier you were. A case in point. We're talking about the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Okay? The word holy means set apart. In the original languages. Now, why would God tell them to remember the Sabbath and keep it set apart? You've got to remember, they fled slavery in Egypt. Every single day of their life, they worked seven, 24-7 as slaves. 
They are worn and frazzled, even their own animals fall exhausted. What Jesus, what God is doing by putting this commandment in front of them is to give them a day off. A day to be restored and recuperate even the animals, to regain their strength. This was a blessing. Originally heard, I suspect it was hallelujah. But somehow it got twisted, didn't it? Uh, the rules of 613 laws had become more stringent. It missed the point and the intent of the original commandment. Take a day off. Recuperate. And now legalism after legalism. And Jesus finally said to them in one passage, The Sabbath was made for you. Not you for the Sabbath. And Jesus did not come to discard the law. Jesus came to reveal the intent of the law in relationship vertically and horizontally. In the Ten Commandments, Jesus shows us that even in those laws, God is for us. Now, Jesus did dismantle the entanglements of the Levites and the priests and their attempt to control every facet of human life, thereby measuring themselves as special. Now, I see often written, even in the some theological um, journals, it says law and grace. And that disturbs me. Maybe I'm just too reformed, too Presbyterian. I'll own that. I find it disturbing because they set apart grace over here and law over here. When I understand grace, it is always God's love and action is defined as grace. Creation is grace. Spiritual growth is grace. And even the Ten Commandments is grace. It serves as a loving God showing us the boundaries that are set up. The law also keeps the peace. Can you imagine a world, I'm sure you can, where everybody goes along doing everything that they personally want to do without regard for another human being. That's called anarchy. And anarchy is as close to a living hell as we can get. But all the patriarchs and matriarchs listened and followed God. But the Ten Commandments understood from Jesus' perspective, if you really understand them, it's about grace. For Jesus shows the light and shines the light on the intent of the Ten Commandments. Not a hostile intent, but a loving intent. Now, I will admit, my, my wife's favorite passage is from the 8th chapter of Romans. 
Every time she looks at a clock, it's 828. Romans 828. I, I swear, it's the truth. The Apostle Paul says this. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. Abraham, led by the Spirit of God. Moses, led by the Spirit of God. Jeremiah, uh, led by the Spirit of God. Elijah, led by the Spirit of God. Jesus, the fullness of the Spirit of God. Paul understood this. That we, our legacy as Christians, is to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. But that Spirit will always be in accord to the original intent in which the Ten Commandments were given. That's grace. But, we live in a real world, don't we? There are those who care nothing. Nothing for the Spirit of God. There are those who never heard about listening for God's voice in our own lives. There are those who, if they actually heard God's voice, would say, you've got to be kidding me. i got better things to do. And for those, the law stands as protection for those who are listening. In fact, the United States of America and many other countries base their standard of laws on relationships found in the Ten Commandments to one another. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Murder. Thou shalt not take that which is not your own. There are prescriptions for protection of family. For those who are not close to the Spirit of God, these laws stand as barriers to protect those who are listening for the voice of God. And I will tell you this right now. I firmly believe those who are listening and respond in faith to the voice of God have completely understood the intent of the Ten Commandments, which Jesus summarized. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, and your neighbor as yourself. On that, All the law and the prophets is summarized. A woman stands raising her hands to heaven. She is unbound. Jesus breaks the law in order to establish The love pro portrayed in the law. Jesus is the fulfillment. Eyes on Jesus. And you will know the Ten Commandments and their intent. I end with the quote from the Swiss theologian Karl Barth, and I know you're tired of hearing him. By the way, I'm teaching a class on Karl Barth's ethics, if you want to tune in. Karl Barth read, said this. Jesus is God's yeah. Yes. God's yes to the world. Jesus is God's yes to the world. That God is saying yes to us. Not nine. Not no. In the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.